Hello people, in this uh, video we want to look at the renal stones uh, investigations that you have to do. So far what have we looked at? We looked at um, uh, that renal stones are more common in men. We looked at the clinical features like pain, uretric coli, uh, colic, hematuria, pyuria, fever can be there. Some signs that you saw were tenderness um, in the renal angle, mass in the loin, right? You saw all these. Then you saw that there can be guarding and rigidity. These people can have urinary tract infection, they can have hypertension because uh, kidney also helps in managing um, blood pressure, isn't it? So, uh, you saw the etiology, it could be because of diet, it can be because of a hot climate, it can be because of decrease in citrate level, infection in the kidney, prolonged immobilization which will cause uh, uh, decalcification of the bones and hypercalciuria leading to stone formation. You saw that metabolic disorders could be there like hyperparathyroidism, gout, hyperoxaluria, Right, because of glycine metabolism, there can be cysteine, um, cysteine urea, right, which could be again a metabolic disorder. I'm saying this, saying this, keep that here. Then there can be um, stasis due to obstruction of urine flow, which can lead to uh, renal stones. Then there can be Randall's plaque theory. This theory tries to explain why there are uh, stones because of an ulcer or an erosion that will uh, be there in the renal papillae, isn't it? Here you see renal papilla and because of that what will happen there that place there will be minute concretions or minor calcium particles which will get deposited in that place and that will lead to stone formation. So you should know this Randall plaque theory. Okay. So this is the etiology that you saw in the last video about renal stones. Then you saw that the stages of stone formation will be like super saturation, nucleus formation, crystallization, aggregation, matrix formation and stone. We just looked at these names. So, supersaturation, there will be a nucleus formation, crystallization, aggregation, matrix formation and stone. Okay. Then we looked at the types of stones. There are four types of stones that you should know. You should know calcium oxalate stones, also called as mulberry stone. Look at this. They have sharp projections, right? They will be hard and single. Why is it come like this? Hard and single. There can be hematuria. So, the blood will accumulate or deposit over this and it will give dark color to the stone. This will be usually in the infected urine. You can see this. Okay. Calcium oxalate stone this is the most common type of stone, remember. So common type of stone. Why am I not able to highlight? Okay. Then you have the uric acid stone. Uh, it's more yellow. So it is uh, multiple small hexagonal faceted. Uh, it will be, it is radiolucent if it is pure uh, uric acid. And this was forming an acidic urine. And people who consume red meat, they will have more of this. This is so soft, right? You can actually uh, remove it by, uh, you can, uh, it will respond to lithotripsy. Shock waves you can give and remove it. Now coming to phosphate stone, also called a staghorn calculi because of the shape that it has. Um, basically it will be in the renal pelvis, isn't it? And it will go on damaging the renal parenchyma. Just see how huge it is. And it will cause urine obstruction. So these people can have UTIs, etc. So you can see it is dirty white or yellow in color, right? And they said that it has smooth edges, which doesn't seem to be the case. Smooth round, it consists of triple phosphate of calcium, magnesium and uh, ammonium. Remember this. Dirty white to yellow in color, it commonly occurs in renal pelvis and it grows and grows in alkaline urine. This is something you have to remember. This is alkaline urine that it grows in. Uh, acidic urine, you saw uric acid, obviously, that makes sense, right? Then, um, uh, what else did they say? This also produces hematuria. It will, uh, there will be recurrent urinary tract infections in these people. Okay. Then, coming to last one, cysteine uh, calculus. Cysteine calculus, basically, they didn't show any photo. This is usually in young girls at puberty that will be because of inborn um, error of metabolism. There will be, uh, they are not able to absorb, uh, reabsorb cysteine. So there is decreased reabsorption of cysteine. So what will happen? The cysteine will be where? In the urine. So it will be cysteine urea. And because of the cysteine in the urine, there can be um, cysteine stones. Okay. And these will have sulfurisms. These are stony. Uh, these, are, these are hard. Okay, these are hard actually. Just remember these are hard. So just remember the four types of uh, renal stones guys, calcium oxalate, very common, uric acid, soft, soft uh, phosphate stones, tank, uh, horn, and cysteine, calculus, girls, and sulfur, and it will be hard, okay. So now let us look at the growth of one type of stone over another type of stone. So there's one type of stone over that one more type of stone is growing, that is called as epitaxy, okay. Epitaxy, 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 say three times epitaxy, stone over stone, different type, okay, epitaxy. Now let us, uh, see. we also saw this in the last uh, one. Shapes of stone uh, crystals in urine. So we saw what shapes will be there, not very important. Let's move on. Now we also saw the complications, hydronephrosis, pyonephrosis, renal failure, carcinoma can be there because of uh, long-standing stones, they will increase the risk of carcinoma. 
Now we have come to the real part of this video that is investigations. Guys, investigations, please uh, look at this. What, what would you order for these people? Yes, you will have to check the blood urea levels, right? Um, what is the, if the kidney is failing or not? So how will you check that you will check by urea and creatine, right? You should check the blood urea and creatine levels to rule out, rule out what? To rule out renal failure. Very good. What should the normal values of urea and creatine be in the blood, guys? What better way to learn than look at your own blood report, guys? Look at this urea creatinine in my own blood serum. Serum um, is 10.9 urea and 0.5 creatinine. So this is perfectly fine. Creatinine 0.58. Look at this. It should be how much? They have checked it by JAF kinetic method or something, isn't it? They are saying that. I just scroll this side. You see what is the creatinine level for 18 to 60 years? The creatinine level should be 0 0.6 to 1.1. Actually, it is nearly 0 0.6. It is less actually. 0 0.6 to 1.1. Okay. Then coming to urea, guys. This is the urea one. UV kinetic method. GLDH urease UV kinetic method. That's how they checked it. 18 to 60 years should be 12 to 42.9. So hard to read this, right? Can you see that? 12 to 12, 12, 12.9. Okay, water something. I have 10.9. This is again less. Is that fine because it's less? So, anyways, I will just write here 12 something it should be. Okay. And creatinine around 0.6 or something they are saying. Let's see both the high values also. So, I just updated here 12.9 to 42 and creatinine 0 0.5 to 1.1. So, this is something what it should be. So, you will, uh, if it is not right, then you will have to rule out renal failure because uh, the kidney is not able to remove the urea and the urea is accumulating in the blood. This much you have understood, right? What are we trying to diagnose here? Renal failure. Then you will take a KUB, that is X ray KUB. What is KUB, guys? KUB is KUB X ray. If you search, what does it say? Kidney ureter and bladder X ray. Okay, so this is what you can see a plain KUB X ray we are showing here. Bilateral large renal stones and right ureteral stones. So it's not just in the kidney, it is also in the ureter. So this is, I'm thinking bilateral large renal stones and this one is a right ureteral stone. Okay. So you will do a KUB, plain KUB. 90% um, of them you can diagnose because they are radio opaque. But some of them are not radio opaque, like pure uric acid. That and all is radio lucent. But anyways, if they will have some calcium oxalate, then they also will become radio opaque. Okay. Then um, what will you see? Enlarged renal shadow they are saying. Okay. UST you can do ultrasound guys. Uh, presence of stone can be diagnosed. Is this, is, this is even better right? No need to expose the person to radiation. You can do ultrasound. And uh, you can also know the exact size and location because you are getting a kind of a, uh, a 3D kind of a thing right? More than a, this is like a 2D. You won't exactly know at what depth it is etc. But in UST you will be able to know the exact size and location. Location of the stone right? IVP, what is IVP guys? Intravenous pylogram, is it? Pylography. So it's an intravenous pylogram. Let's just put the name here. Intravenous pylogram. So basically this is also an x-ray kind of thing only, but it uses contrast material, okay? So what will you do here in this? You will use contrast. Contrast, okay? In x-ray. And then you take an x-ray. So you will locate the stone exactly in relation to the kidney and ureter and assess the renal function. So you will also assess the renal function because it is trying to clear the contrast from your body, isn't it? So you will also know the renal function. You will also be able to tell the exact uh, location of the stone. A non-radio opaque stone can be seen as a filling defect. So if it is non-radio opaque, that means in x-ray you were not able to find it. But at least in this, because of contrast, you will be able to see it because there will be a filling defect. You will be able to spot it as a filling defect. Hydronephrosis and hydronephroureterosis can be seen. So you can know any swelling because of urine um, uh, backflow. You can see hydronephrosis, hydronephroureterosis also. Okay. Then non-contrast CT. See, this one is nice because non-contrast, you don't have to give any contrast. So, non-contrast CT and contrast CT can uh, are used for more accurate detection of causes of abdominal colic. Okay. So, now what they are using is actually non-contrast CT scan. Okay. Because I know that somebody went in with this uh, with suspected kidney stones and Manipal, actually Manipal hospitals in Bangalore actually did a non-contrast CT scan. Okay. Very expensive. They will charge you around 10,000 for that.
urine uh, for culture and sensitivity. So you can check uh, for UTIs, guys. That's it. Don't forget this. You might forget this point. Okay, because of UTI, you'll have to check. So the investigations we are done, guys. So you understood the investigations for uh, renal stones. What and all you will do? Come on, let's summarize. You will uh, first do a blood for um, urea and creatinine. So you will check for renal function. Very good. And then you will check for you will do uh, X-ray KUB. You will do kidney ureter bladder. Then you can do a IV pyelogram uh, because uh, intravenous pyelogram just because you want to know if there are some radio lucent kind of things, right? And then you can do CT scan which they spoke about non-contrast and contrast two things they said. Then you will check the urine analysis, uh, culture and sensitivity. You will do because you want to know if there is any UTI and which antibiotic is susceptible to. Did we miss anything in this entire thing? USG, oh yeah, USG. So you can do ultrasound also. Very good. So now let's move on. We're done with investigations, guys. Let's move on to the next slide here. Let's just look at these photos. Plain X-ray KUB, multiple stones in the right kidney. Multiple stones are there in right kidney. Phosphate stone in kidney and oxalate stone in urinary bladder. Wow. So zoom this a little. So they're saying this is a phosphate stone. And in the bladder, there are some oxalate stone. Is it because of this? kind of shape that they are showing that it's oxalate stone. So big is it? <coughs> okay. Then there are some things here. Look. This is just showing some large stone here. And what is this? Bilateral staghorn calculi. This is bilateral staghorn. You can see the shape. Something like that, right? Bilateral staghorn calculi. So we looked at renal calculi causes, complications, uh, stages of formation, types of uh, renal calculi. We looked at the investigations and management. We have looked at the investigations. Now we have to go to the treatment. Okay. So uh, yeah, in this we also looked at the clinical features, right? So many things we have looked at. Now let us go to um, treatment. Okay. So you can divide the treatment into non-operative and operative. Okay. So non-operative, you can say conservative. Extracorporeal shock wave lithotripsy. Just let's look at the high level, okay? Then we have to anyways go into details of all this. Operative treatment, you have endoscopic procedures, you will do open procedures, you will open up or you have to go via endoscopy and do some operation. And then you have special situations, we we'll look at that. Now look at um, uh, these uh, open procedures. Open procedures have some names, guys. So basically you have pyelolithotomy, pyelolithotomy, nephrolithotomy. Extended pyelolithotomy, pyelonephrolithotomy, partial nephrectomy, nephrectomy. So these two are coming under nephrectomy. They are trying to remove a part of the kidney. Is it partial and nephrectomy? Okay, leave that. Here we are talking about lithotomy, 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 lithotomy. Okay, all these we have to look at. Look at this photo here. It talks about all these procedures. Yes, look at this. Um, all the lithotomies guys, this one is nephrectomy partial, but as of now you won't understand, let's read the text and then understand line by line. Let's get started with non-operative, let's talk about conservative. conservative. Conservative, see here you are not saying medical management because you are writing a surgery exam. If you are writing surgery exam, don't use the word medical, okay. So basically any stones which are less than 5 millimeter, they will pass off by itself, okay. If you just take lot of fluids, right. And you are doing some forced uh, urination, right? Diuresis. If you are just trying to push out everything, the forced diuresis, uh, not exactly urination, but forced diuresis is the word they are using. So then you will be able to push out these stones. If they are less than what? 5 millimeter stone. Okay. So what will you do in this? You will take water. Lot of copious amounts of fluids you will take and you will do forced diuresis. Okay. So you can also give intravenous hydration, um, then you will give them furosemide. What will furosemide do? It is a diuretic. So they will be able to pass the, pass the stone. So they are talking about IV hydration, IV furosemide we are saying. Okay. So all these are conservative. Okay. Conservative, not even, yeah, kind of just drink water. If it is less than 5 mm size stone, you should know this by the way. Then coming to extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy. So what will you do? Here you will have a double J stent. Okay, we will show you that. This one, see here. DJ stent. See this. 
TJ stent in place. Here also they're showing a plain X-ray showing right-sided renal stone with J stent on left side. Okay. So basically, after cytoscopy, a ureteric stent, a double J stent, is placed into the ureter. So they where are they placing this? They are placing the stent into the ureter. Wherever you have the large renal stone, whichever side has large stone, there you have to put in this. And after placing the stent, okay, so this is a stent. Wait. So I hope you are enjoying the background music. But anyways, this is a stent that they have placed, and then what they are doing? They are doing lithotripsy. So whatever stones are here, they are trying to break them off, right? Then what happens? These stones will get crushed, and most of the stones will come out from where? From this stent. Very good. So. If it is uh, large stones, they have to do lithotripsy. So they are doing extracorporeal shock wave lithotripsy. What do you mean by corporeal, guys? Body. It's strange that they are calling it as extracorporeal lithotripsy, isn't it? But E S W L. If they ask you in their exam, you will write extracorporeal shock wave lithotripsy. So shock wave lithotripsy. This part you know. <clears throat> you'll give shock wave and uh, lithotripsy you're doing but you're also putting a stent here to bring the stones out so just note that you cannot use this for cysteine stones guys it is not effective in pragmatic cysteine stones because of its crystal lattice then you have something called as laser lithotripsy where you use holmium yag laser okay this has a good safety margin they are saying then this can be used to fragment all types of stones can be used for all types of stones okay then uh, there's something here they're using this term steen straws it means stone street so what they are saying here is guys this word steen straws is stone street that is so many stones are coming out right like this after you did lithotripsy so many stone 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 stones are coming out small pieces of fragmented calculi collect and obstruct in the distal ureter so they start obstructing the distal ureter because of these small small stones so this is called as steen straws what is it called as steen straws steen straws say say steen straws steen 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 straws let's write that spelling somebody asks you what is a steen Straws, steen straws is this ureter. So many small, small stones blocking the street, stone street, steen straws. Okay. Now let's move on. So you understood the non-operative treatment is over. Now we have to move on to operative treatment. Just look at this table here. Uh, advantages of ESWL. There is no incision. Yes, you're just putting. How did they put the stent? The stent actually went in via cystoscopy, guys. So via the bladder, you have gone and then you have input the stent, and it's a double J stent. Okay, double J. There are two J's here, and there's no pain. They are saying, which is interesting. Okay, what are the disadvantages? It will be very costly and not available everywhere. Guys, look at these photos from another textbook. Um, so this is uh, this is SRB manual actually. Look at this. They have shown this bed empty. Right, and now they are showing it with a man on it, and they are showing some. Sh this is how shock waves come, is it? So this is extracorporeal shock wave lithotripsy. That is the word, isn't it, guys? Lithotripsy. So lithotripsy. So basically, you are using this uh, for renal stones. It needs C arm to guide the exact point of stone stone to, to be fragmented. So it has a C arm here. That's what they are saying. Some more uh, information on this uh, extracorporeal shock wave lithotripsy, guys. So they are using. Um, piezo ceramic electromagnetic shock waves okay they will pass uh, to the stone how through water bath or water cushion so they are producing shocks at 2 per second 1000 to 4000 shocks are required for each stone are you understanding anything at all dornier lithotripter is used for fragmenting stones then you will locate and observe through fluoroscope that is the c arm or ultrasound then shock waves are triggered to create compressive waves over the stone fragmented these fragments are crushed out later okay look at the advantages of um, what guys extra corporeal shock wave lithotripsy so you don't need to give anesthesia you can do it as an outpatient procedure less than 2.5 cm stones are well fragmented if it's a very huge stone what happens uh we will we'll come to that La hard stones oxalic stones are eliminated by 
E S W L, but not sixteen stones. That's what they said, right? You can do uh, repeatedly in different settings. You can uh, sit. Uh, you can do multiple settings. Looks like, right? If it is not successful, you can then you can go to percutaneous nephrolitho. What is that? Litho nephrolitho. Percutaneous nephrolithotomy. You can do, guys. Let's look at the complications of this uh, extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy. You can get a renal hematoma, hematuria. Okay, so there is bleeding, there is blood in urine. There can be an injury to adjacent structures. The fractured stone can be retained in the ureter. So one of those things you saw, right? What is that called as street stones, right? What are the contraindications to do this extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy? Pregnancy, you should not do bleeding disorders because they are suspecting hematoma, hematuria, etc. Patients with abdominal aneurysms, again I am thinking of bleeding here. Sepsis and renal failure. So if this person is in renal failure, you should not do this. Here, let's continue with the operative treatment in the next video, guys. What do you say? Bye-bye. Hmm?